all say together the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture lesson this morning is taken from Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 12. Now, in the church of Antioch, Barnabas and there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tartet, and saw why they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on the way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucus and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in a Jewish synagogue. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Pepos. There, they met, they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name is, means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him. And he grouped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Yes, it's a wonderful morning. Take out your sermon notes as we continue with our series on Paul's defining moments. You know, we've been talking about, uh, we just started last week, and we're looking at the life of Paul, and we're looking at the defining moments in his life. How, okay, what is defining moments? Defining moments are moments or periods in our lives when God challenges us to make a decision, when God challenges us to either do something or to react in a certain way, and that will define our future. It defines the rest of our life. It defines the direction our life will take. And sometimes defining moments we fail and we end up in a mediocre life, in a life that, uh, that, that doesn't fulfill the potential of God. And sometimes because of our defining moments, we take the step that is, that, that is not what God wants. We end up destroying relationships. We end up drawing away from people. We end up hurting people. But sometimes when we, do it the, when we, do, when we, we shine the way God wants us to shine, we end up with a bright future in the plan of God, in the grace of God. And so before we start, let us go to the Lord in prayer. 
wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honor and all glory. And Lord, this morning we ask once again for your Spirit to come and fill our midst. For your Spirit to come and speak to us, Lord. Open our hearts to hear your word into, speaking into our lives. Drown every other voice, even our own voice, our own skepticism, our own uh, mindsets, so that we'll be able to hear the voice of your Spirit speaking to us. Lord, I just commit all of us unto your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is the richest place on earth? What do you think? Where's the richest place on earth? <laughs> Fort Knox. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. You know, I don't think I, that the richest place is not the oil fields in Arabia, neither is it the diamond mines in Africa, nor the rare earth mines in China, nor the bauxite mines in Pahang. Those are not the richest place on earth. But someone once said, a wise man, Les Brown once said this, he says that, that the graveyard is the richest place on earth. The graveyard. Because it is here that you will find all the hopes and dreams that were never fulfilled. The books that were never written. The songs that were never sung. The inventions that were never shared. The cures that were never discovered. All because someone was too afraid to take the first step. I like to say that the richest place in the church is in the graveyard too. Because it's in the graveyard where many Christians' potentials were never realized. It's in the graveyard where many lives were gone, but they never lived to the fullness that God had in store for them. And there were many lives who were lived just, 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 just being there but they never fulfill the full plans of God, the full potential of God in their lives. And the graveyard is very often the richest place on earth. And that's what we want to talk about today. The defining moment, you know, when, when our potential needs to be realized. You see, when we saw last week that Paul's, uh, Paul's conversion was his defining moment, and not just his decision to follow Jesus, but the decision on how he wants to follow Jesus. And it, it, I know he talks about his attitude in following Jesus. But as we continue with Paul's life, you see, we, we, we saw how Paul disappeared to Tarsus. He disappeared there for about 8 to 10 years into obscurity, disappeared from Scripture altogether. And after these 8 to 10 years, the church was continuing to grow because Paul was being a stumbling block to the growth of the church at that time. And after 8 to 10 years, he has been removed from the church. The church began to grow in Antioch again. And the church in Antioch was growing. It was booming. Disciples were coming. Christians were coming. People were coming to believe in God. And, the, and Barnabas, an apostle from Jerusalem, went up to Antioch to check the matter out. He saw the people were being grown and he, and he realized that they need teaching. They need more help. And so Barnabas went all the way to Tarsus to look for Saul, Paul, who is now called Paul. And he went to look for Paul and said, Paul, I need help in Antioch. Antioch needs help. It's growing. The Lord's work is being done. We need more manpower. And the Bible tells us that Paul went. Paul followed Barnabas to Antioch to, to be a leader there, to teach, to disciple, to train, to build the church. And you know, friends, Paul did not stay there and say, Aya, Barnabas, you know, I tried it once, lah. Eight years ago, I tried it, but it didn't work out. Paul didn't come to Barnabas and say, Aya, you know, I did it before. I, I mean, I had my days already. I already had my glorious, my success already. Now it's time for me to retire. Paul did not go and tell Barnabas, no la, I had bad experience the last time, you remember? They kicked me out. They want to murder me. Did Paul didn't do that. Paul followed. Paul just stepped up and followed. And Paul went with Barnabas. And as they continued to grow in the ministry there, later on, in the passage that was just read by our dear brother, the Holy Spirit spoke to the church and said, set aside for me. I want Paul and Barnabas to do even greater work for me. I want Paul and Madabas to be missionaries, to be sent out to even do greater work. And in, the, in that moment's notice, the Bible tells us that Paul and Barnabas answered the call and they stepped up. Let me read to you Acts 13 verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, 
the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Paul, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. You see, that was the beginning of Paul's missionary journey. That was the beginning of Paul's life as an evangelist, as a ministry for God. And the story goes on to tell, you know, from that moment on, his ministry grew. From that moment on, you know, he grew beyond what he could ever imagine. Earlier on, he was sharing the gospel in Jerusalem and Damascus. People want to murder him. He was making no converts. He was just end up fighting with people. But when he answered the call, of the Holy Spirit and he went with Barnabas to Cilicia to, to, to Cyprus for the first time in his life God used him miraculously when he was encountered a person of, uh, that, that was challenging his ministry see what happens in Acts 13 verse 9 it says then Saul who is called Paul filled with the Holy Spirit looked intently at him and said oh fool of all deceit and fraud you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing for the, the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done. Paul, not only was he used by God to evangelize, he was used by God in miraculous ways that he could never have imagined, that he could never have think of in his earlier days. And, you know, he, he, for the first time in Paul's life, a miracle took place. And because of that miracle, the proconsul or the head of state came to believe. And subsequently, the entire city, the entire nation came to believe. You know, I often wondered what would have happened if Paul stayed put in Tarsus? What would have happened if Paul chose not to follow Barnabas? When Barnabas came knocking on his door, Paul decided not to step up. He said, nah lah, my time is up lah. I've done it already. I've been there before. I've done it before. I've succeeded before. I've enough. I wonder, often I wonder what happened when the Holy Spirit told, ministered to the church and told the church, send Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas decided, ayah, never mind, lah. Barnabas enough, lah. one man chukup, lah. no need two people. And Paul decided to stay put. I wonder what would have happened. I wonder what Paul would have missed. In fact, friends, would you write me the first point of your notes is this. You will never know what you miss when you refuse to step up. <clears throat> You'll never know. You'll never know what you miss when you refuse to step up. You, 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 because when you never step up, when God calls you to step up, you'll never know what is the future that God had in store for you that you're going to miss. You'll never know what you miss. You know, I remember my, that day we were walking with my children. You know, my children, every time we go to shopping complexes, they like to play those rides, you know, like the, you know, the, like the arcades place there, they those, you put one dollar, they drive the car, or you put one dollar, they sit something like a mechanical horse, you know, those type of things, you know what children like, right? Huh? So my children love to do those things. And every time we go to shopping complexes, they will say, Daddy, Daddy, let's play this, Daddy, let's play this, even though it's one dollar, two dollar, five dollar, and sometimes we just want to limit them. Lah. And also, I don't want to spend so much money, right? So one day, we were walking, I think it was in Makota Parade, they didn't, they don't know this. Now they're going to find out. We were walking in Makota Parade. And I saw from the top floor as I was walking, I looked down from the foyer to the, to, the, to the ground floor. You know, the top floor, you can look down to the ground floor. At the ground floor, I saw giant robots, full-size robots with a place where a child can sit and control the robots and fight with each other. I saw that, I say, my goodness, if my children see that, we will never leave this place until they make us sit. Let, let them sit that ride. And I know if that ride ain't going to cost me one dollar, <laughs> that's going to be a handful. And so, from the minute we came out of the shop, I brought my children, I, told my, I showed my wife what it was, I said, shh, shh. And every time my children wanted to walk towards the foyer, the, the, the balcony to look down, I will tell them, hey, hey, come, 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 look, look, look. See, this one's so nice here. 
at the minute when they go, they say, hey, children, 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 come here, come here, come here. You see, you see, you see what, what? I show you something interesting here. And every time they were about to step up to the balcony, I would distract them and call them back away from the balcony until we reach the car. Until today, they never knew what they missed. Until now. <laughs> but you see, friends, a lot of times, we will go through these kind of defining moments in our lives. When God prompts us to step up to see, to do something. And when we don't step up, we will never know what we miss. We'll never know what is it that we miss. For some of us, it could be something simple. As God asks us to step up and to serve Him. And we, and we never do it. We'll never know what we miss. For some of us, it could be just something as simple as changing a mindset. Changing an attitude a disposition of your heart. And because we never do it, we'll never know what we miss. For some of us, it could be something more serious, more life-changing, like coming into full-time ministry or giving a certain, committing a certain amount of your time to the work of the Lord or certain things. And because we never choose to step up, we will never know what blessings from the Lord that we miss. I remember when I went on my first mission trip to Indonesia in Medan. This was the first time I went as a young, I think I was a young Christian, 19 years old or 20 years old, I went for that. And I was, don't know, I mean, I was like, want to go or don't want to go, my parents didn't want me to go, but I, yeah, in the end, we decided to go. And because I went, I mean, I mean, if I never went, I would have missed it all. But because I went, I remember we had an evangelistic rally, the speaker was preaching, blah, 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 all that, and they called people out for healing. And when they call, and we were team members, they called us, go and pray for the people. So we just stand there and we simply pray. And I tell you, just because you are from a foreigner coming to visit them, they think you are very anointed, they think you are very spiritual, they think you are very... And so they think you are this man, great man of God coming to pray for them. When in reality, I don't know anything. But anyway, I went, I sat there, and I just stand and I just prayed. Okay lah, one second, what happened? Ayah, sakit tulang lah. Okay lah, sakit lah. Okay, pray. Ayah, sakit belakang lah. Okay, sakit belakang. Then suddenly, one man came, one boy came up. I think it was a teenage boy. His eyes, I can't even see the eyeball. The eye was completely grey. The whole colour of the eye, it was not white, it was not black. It was completely grey. I don't know what sickness it was. I couldn't even see the eyeball. And the mother brought him up. And they say that he wants to pray. Pray for healing so that he can see. I was like, my goodness, what to proud to see. I can't even see his eye. What do you want to see with? But the Lord just said, just, just pray. Okay, so I just pray anything I knew how to pray. And after that prayer, the boy, the, the boy was just telling the mother that he began to see shapes, shadows from nothing. He's beginning to see certain, you know, can be his... The vision is coming back. It's not completely, but he's beginning to see shadows and shapes and there's light. And I thought to myself, wow, imagine if I've never gone on that trip. Imagine if I decided to just enjoy my holidays, sit home and play video games every day. Imagine what I would have missed. And I wonder, for some of us here today, what have we missed? You know, the Israelites were on the verge of the promised land. The Israelites followed Moses out of Egypt. They came to the Canaan. They came to the border of the promised land. And God told them, it's time to step up and go in and conquer the land. But they refused. They were full of fear. They said, we've always had a nice life in the wilderness. We don't want to end up with battles. We don't want to change our lifestyle. We don't want to change the way we are doing things. We are happy where we are. We don't want to go in. We are scared. And because of that, they missed everything. When you go back and you read the book of Joshua, how when Joshua went in to the promised land, and how the people, how God gave them miracles after miracles, how God helped them drive the Canaan out, how they experienced the land flowing with milk and honey. And when I look at all of that, I ask myself, the first generation Israelites missed all that. And they never knew. They never knew what they missed. I wonder, how many times have we missed God's blessings, God's plan in our lives because during our defining moment, we just refuse to step up. Just imagine all the people in the Bible that you know their stories. Imagine if they never stepped up. 
what would they have missed? Now let me ask you this question. Imagine your life and imagine what you have already missed because you did not step up. Imagine what you could have missed when God called you, when God prompted you, when God nudged you, but you just refused to step up. Now, why is it so difficult for us to step up? Why is it so difficult that when God prompts us to do something, we just don't want to do it? Why is it so difficult for us to take the step to step up in our lives? Well, a lot of reasons. People will say, oh, because we are so comfortable. Some will say because we are complacent. Some say because of fear. Some say because uh, we, we do not know what's going to happen. Well, let me tell you this. Yeah, those are all valid reasons. But I believe at the heart of the matter... The truth is, you can write the next point of your notes is this, that we made the value of our present good greater than our future best. Let me repeat. We made the value of our present good greater than God's future best. You see, let me explain, let me explain. Huh? A lot of times, whether we choose to step up or to stay where we are, the choice is, is basically a choice. It boils down to a choice. And when it comes to choices, it's like how we make decisions in all choices. You evaluate the choice and you see there's two options. Let's say two options. You evaluate both options. And when, they, and when both options are of this equal value, you have difficulty choosing. But when, when both options are have a higher value and one has a lower value, it becomes very easy to choose. Isn't that true? Let's say I have a choice between a $1,000 a month job and a $10,000 a month job. No choice. No need to choose. And the, the decision is made. If, if it's a choice between driving a Honda Cup or a Mercedes-Benz. No choice. It's a cho- you don't have to choose. Because the value is just so disparate between the two. If it's between eating fried rice and medium rare steak, the choice is not there to choose. There's no choice. You know, it's just so easy because the value is just so wide. But when the values become almost equal, now that's harder. If you have to choose between a medium rare steak and a German pork knuckles, now that is tough. That is tough. Now you know the second thing your pastor likes to eat. <laughs> that is tough. When you have to choose between shark's fin soup and abalone soup or red bean soup, there's no choice. It's easy. But when, you have, but when the, choice, the value of the choices are almost equal, it becomes difficult. And now here's the secret, friends. The value that we assign to our choices is up to us. It's not intrinsic, intrinsic in the choice itself. It's up to us. You choose the value that you want to assign to your choices. You know, you may think that it has an intrinsic value, but it doesn't. Because it's up to you to decide what value you want to give to your choice. And so when I look at a steak, I see a steak, I'm telling you, the value is at least a good steak. Lah. A real nice steak will be at least minimum 100 ringgit. That's the value of a steak. But a bowl of salad is nothing more than, I think, $10. Less than that, you can get a nice bowl of salad. And so you can see the value is so disparaged. But when you, when you give a different value to it, and you look at the value of cholesterol versus antioxidants, it changes. Because the value of our choices depends on what we assign to it what value we want to assign to it. And listen to this, friends. Very often, this is what we do. Very often, we look at our present life. And although our present life has this value, we assign a value that is, wow, is so much greater than it actually is. And when we look at the future that God may give us, the things that God may give us, everything that's unimaginable. The Bible says, you know, whatever you can hope for and think or imagine, God is able to do abundantly more than that. So whatever we imagine and we can think, that future, very often we assign a lower value to it. 
And so what happens that what it ought to be, the future that God has, a future where we fulfill our full potential in God, which has this high value, and our present mediocre life, which is in this value in God, what we do is we increase the value of this present future, this present situation, and we devalue God's future. And because of that, we look at our present and say, no, this is more value. And so I choose to stay put rather than to step up. When in reality, this is of much greater value and our present situation is of much lower value in comparison to what God has installed for us. But because we don't see it that way, and because we look at our lives and we look at what we have, we assign a lower value. It's like the Israelites again. You know, when they came out of Egypt, they were about to cross the Red Sea. Pharaoh's armies were coming behind them, wanted to kill them, and they were facing the Red Sea. And they look at Moses, and this is what they said to Moses in Exodus 14, verse 20. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. You see how they have distorted the value of their situations? You see, they, they, they saw that serving the Egyptians... Living a life of servitude, of slavery, of being oppressed by the Egyptians, which is of extremely low value, they gave that a value that is so much higher in comparison to God's promised land. Because they took God's promised land, God's land flowing of milk with milk and honey, God's land of the God's full potential for the nation of Israel, they took all of that and they reduced that value to dying in the wilderness. They reduce the value of God's promise and God's potential to lower than what their situation is actually. And they raise the value of their present situation. And because of that, many times we choose not to step up. Because it's rather it's better to stay where we are because the value looks so wonderful. And friend, let me tell you this. That is the exact tactic or the strategy of the devil to get you to stay where you are. That's the devil's strategy. is to get you to assign a higher value to your present state. To, to get you to be distracted with the values of the things around you at your present state that you would not realize the things you miss in the future that God has for you. It's like my children again, you know, back to the same story I was telling you just now. You know, you know, uh, every, time, every time they were to go there, they want to see the, see the robot, which is of much higher value. I will distract them and tell them, hey, come, come, look at this. Wow, look at this shop here, got this little nice picture here, which I'll never buy for you anyway. But I, give, I make it sound like this is so much more worth looking at than to go that way. And every time they want to, to go to step up their side, I will assign a greater excitement a greater value. I will make whatever that we have here sound so much more exciting and valuable than going over to look what is down there. And let me tell you, friends, the devil does the same thing. I was the devil that day for my children. But the devil does the exact same thing. And when God prompts us to step up, the devil will always say, hey, this is more interesting. Hey, no, this life is better. No, 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 what you're doing now is more comfortable. Hey, no, 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 this, 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 this career path is much better. No, 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 this, this opportunity is much better. This, 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 this country is much better. This state is much better. This life is much better. And every time God wants to push you to a direction, the devil will say, no, this is much better. And he gets you to assign a higher value to what you are living right now. And that's why John Wesley says this. He says, I value all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. I value all things only by the price that they shall gain in eternity. In other words, John, value underst- John Wesley understood this principle very well. That whatever in life that God has for him, he values it not based on what he sees in life, but based on what heaven values it. When he decides to step up or not to step up, he looks at it and says, what is heaven's value to it? When I assign value to my ministry, to my work, the question is, what is heaven's value to that? When I look at my possessions, the things I have, what is heaven's value to that? 
When I get a job offer or a promotion in the office, I ask, what is God's, what is heaven's value in it? Does it require less time for God, less time for ministry, less time for family? Then I will know heaven's value in it. When choosing between going to disciple group and sleeping, what is the value that heaven assigns to it? When I choose whether I should I serve in a certain area, I don't want to serve because people have hurt me before. I don't want to serve because I'm comfortable where I am. What is the value that heaven assigns to it? Question then, friends, how do we start? How do we get our lenses right so that we can start seeing things and valuing them according to what heaven values? Especially when the Holy Spirit prompts us. What do we do? When the Holy Spirit prompts us to do a certain ministry, to step up to a certain area, to, to, to change a certain attitude, to, to, to get rid of certain mindsets, what do we respond? How do you respond? On the next point of your notes, entertain no excuses. Because God doesn't. Entertain no excuses because God doesn't. You know, somehow we just we think very ridiculously sometimes, you know. Just because we give an excuse, we think that God accepts it. You know, it's like my children, you know, they come up with the weirdest excuse in the world. And because they think of those excuses, they say those excuses, I look at them, I'm just exasperated with them. They go away, they think I accepted their excuses. No! I didn't accept it, I'm just exasperated with them. And how often is God like that with us? We can give a lot of excuses to God, but God doesn't entertain them actually, you know. And that's why when we are prompted, see, when we are prompted by God to do something, automatically the first response is always an excuse. Just test your mind. The first thing when you're prompted to do something, the first thing that comes to your mind is, ah yeah, what's the excuse I can give? That's what we do. We like to give excuses. You know? In fact, a, hus- a wife was trying to get the husband to be more healthy, to live a healthier life. And this husband is an expert in excuse. The wife looked at the husband and said, hey, husband, you know, dear, you need to live, you need to exercise more in order to prolong your life. And the husband said, no, 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 dear, don't you understand how the heart works? The heart is like a, 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 any machine. It can only beat for a certain amount of time. And when you exercise, you beat it faster, you beat it more, it will expire faster. It's like driving a car. You don't drive the engine faster to keep the engine living longer. You use it less so the car will last longer. So, you cannot exercise. And the wife said, okay, 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 fine. Why not you start eat, cut down on your meat, eat less meat, and eat more fruits and vegetables? And the husband said, dear, don't you understand how uh, efficiency works? You see, what do cows eat? Grass. And when cows eat the grass, and I eat the cow, it's a much more efficient way of eating the grass. The wife getting exasperated and now say, okay, okay, how about your alcohol intake? Stop taking alcohol so much. Say, honey, you know that alcohol is made from wine. Wine is made from fruits. And brandy is distilled wine. Meaning what they do is they remove all the water from the fruit and they leave the good fruity part for you to eat and drink. And so wine is healthy, brandy is healthy because you've got more fruits and less water. Okay, okay, why not you eat less fried food? I was say, oh, no, 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 don't you understand? Nowadays, they fry everything in vegetable oil. And more vegetable is good for you, right? So fried things are good for you. And the husband, just to end it all, the husband said, okay, let me, let me explain to you something about heart attacks. I'm not scared of heart attacks, you know why? Because statistics have shown that the Japanese eat very little fatty stuff and they suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. The Mexicans eat a lot of fatty food and they still suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. The Chinese drink very little red wine and they suffer less heart attacks than Americans. The Italians drink a lot of red wine and they still suffer less heart attacks than Americans. The Germans drink a lot of beers, eat a lot of fatty stuff, and they also suffer less heart attacks than Americans. So, eating fatty stuff, drinking alcohol doesn't cause heart attacks. Being American does. 
We can come up with all the excuses in the world. And sometimes we think we are very smart. But God doesn't entertain any excuses. Because let me tell you this, friends, honestly. No matter what excuse we give, or whatever excuse that you have been used to giving, at the back of your mind, you know it's nothing more than an excuse. In the heart of your heart, in the back of your mind, you know that it's just an excuse. It's not real. It's not the truth. It's just an excuse. You know, it's like, and, and although we know it's an excuse, we still give it as an excuse. And although we know it's not right, we know it's not the right excuse to give, but yet we still give it. It's a nature, human nature. That's why we need to cut off all excuses, you know. It's our human nature to do that. It's like, it's like you when you're driving, you know. You guys, you know, you think you guys are good drivers, very law-abiding drivers, right? Then you drive, drive, drive. You see the light turning from green and it starts blinking when it's green. So what you do is you faster pursue, drive faster. Then the minute it turns yellow, you drive faster. Then it turns red, you cross the red line. What's the first thing you do? You look at the back, any policeman or not? Why? Because you know what you're doing is not right, but you do it anyway. Likewise, we know our excuses are just excuses, but we give it anyway. We cling on to it anyway. And we say, we justify it anyway. Although we know it's nothing more than just excuses. So friends, if you want to start experiencing God's grace and the things that you miss, you want to stop missing the things that you have missed. Seize all excuses. Start seizing, giving excuses. No more excuses. Because God doesn't entertain excuses. A parable in uh, Luke 14 says this. Jesus gave a parable and he says, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I brought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. Uh, let's be honest. If you want to buy a piece of land, you should see it, right? It's very irresponsible if you don't see the land. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. It's like buying five cars. I bought five Mercedes Benz. And I need to go and test drive them. I never test drive the car. I buy them very stupid, right? So it's very responsible. Still, another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. This guy got good theology. I must put my family first. I must take care of my wife first before I take care of the church. Very good theology. So that servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, lanes and city. Bring in the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame and the blind. And verse 23, then the master said, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in my house that may be filled. Verse 24, listen carefully. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. What God is saying is this. Yes, I know a lot of your excuses are very valid. A lot of your excuses are very true. They are, they are valid, but they are nothing more than excuses and God doesn't entertain excuses and because you are just giving an excuse you will never taste my supper you will never taste what I have in store for you you will never taste the promise of the promised land because you refuse to step up you will never taste the parting of the Red Sea because you never stepped up you will never taste the, the killing of Goliath because you never stepped up you will never taste the crossing of the Jordan because you never stepped up you will never taste the walls of Jericho falling down because you never stepped up why? because the final point of your notes is this miracles only reveal themselves after you step up, not before. Miracles only reveal themselves after you step up, not before. Part of the problem for us is we always tell God is this, Lord, I want you to show me the results, then I will do it. I want you to show me the promise, then I will do it. I want you to show me the miracle, then I will do it. I want you to show me what will happen, then I will go. It doesn't work that way, friends. God always requires a step of faith before the miracles will come into our lives. God always requires His people to take a step of faith and trust before we, they will see 
His marvellous works. The Israelites were at the verge of the Red Sea. They were at the Red Seas. Pharaoh's army is coming. Pharaoh's army is coming to destroy them. The people look at Moses. There's a sea in front of us. There is Pharaoh behind us. What shall we do? And they were crying and they were crying out to God. They say, God, what shall we do? And Moses was praying to God. Say, God, help us. What shall we do? Listen to God's answers. Exodus 14 verse 15. And the Lord says to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Why are you crying? Why are you praying? Why are you, comp- why are you, talk- why are you praying? God is, as though God is telling Moses, shut up. Stop praying. Sometimes we like to use prayer as an excuse, you know. Oh, pastor, pastor, let me pray about it first uh, before I decide. Let me pray about this before I do it. I mean, it's just prayer has become such a wonderful excuse that we think is the mother of all excuses. If we can't think of any excuse, the excuse will be, let me pray about it. And, most, and God is telling Moses, shut up. Don't pray anymore. Do what? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. No, no, but, but God... Let me see the Red Sea part a bit first, la. then only I move forward. Oh, let me see the wind blow a bit and the sea, the water shaking, then I move forward. No. God told the children, you move forward. And when you start moving forward into the sea, then it part. It doesn't part until you move forward. No amount of prayer is making it part. It only part when you get up and you move forward. And the sea begins to part. If we never choose to step up in our defining moments, we'll never experience what God has in stock for us. I want to close with this poem written by Jackie French Kohler. It's titled, What If? Did you ever stop and think how the world would be if folks had turned out differently. For instance, what if Ben Franklin never tried to fly a kite or Shakespeare never tried to write? What if Einstein never used his brain or the Wright brothers never tried to fly a plane? What if Lincoln never tried to free the slaves or Susan B. Anthony was afraid to make waves? What if Alexander Graham Bell was content to just yell? What if Ford never tried to make a car and Walt Disney never wished upon a star? What if Beethoven never tried to play? What if Mother Teresa turned away? What if Babe Ruth was afraid to swing a bat? What if Columbus accepted that the world was flat? What if Luciano Pavarotti tried, never tried to sing? What if dreams were never enough for Martin Luther King? What if Jim Thorpe never entered the race? Or Berish Nikov let another dance in his place? What if Michelangelo thought he wasn't good enough? Or John Glenn feared he didn't have the right stuff? What if all the folks who've changed the world had lived and died and never tried? What if you had a dream and you held it inside and never tried? What if God has something unimaginable for you? What if God has something that is beyond what you could ever think of or dream of, but you never step up? What if? Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise. And we thank you, Lord, for the life of Paul. And we thank you, Lord, that Paul was a man who was always willing to answer when you call, who was always willing to step up when you prompt him. We thank you, Lord. Lord, this morning we ask that you help us to be such a person. Lord, help us to realize the years of our lives that we have missed your grace. We have missed your miracles because we were never willing to step up. Because we were never willing to do what you prompted us to do. 
Forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be a people who would respond to you whenever you call. To be a people who would respond to you whenever you nudge us, whenever you promise us. Help us, Lord, to be such a people so that we will never ever again miss what you have in store for us, Lord. Lord, I just commit all my brothers and sisters here unto your hands. Lord, may they leave this place never ever missing again the things you have in store for them. Lord, I just commit them to your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.